Would you continue on, Doctor, if you know where you are, so I don't have to repeat this, please? I think we're at uh, we're at the uh, David Thomas. I think at age twenty nine. Not nineteen. Yeah. At age twenty nine, um, Jeffrey met David Thomas, his ninth victim. He reported that he met him on his way to a bar. He propositioned him and then brought him back to his apartment. They watched the video. He gave him a drink, strangled him, and then posed him. He kept the body for one to two days, and he laid the body on the edge of his tub and, quote, slid open his belly, end quote. He took pictures of him. He defleshed him, acidified the flesh and skull, and kept the skull. He wanted to dry the skull out quicker and consequently took the victim uh, Edward Skull and David Thomas's skull and put them in the oven. He reported that he heard popping noises and that it was the water vapor expanding in the skull and flaking. The skulls were destroyed. He did not save the body or eat any part of it. Jeffrey mentioned that an escalation of his behavior had occurred. The initial behaviors were now not as satisfying to him, and that his, quote, moral pompous had been shot, total depravity, end quote, period. Although he functioned at work, he spent his time fantasizing about necrophilia and his compulsion in this area. He stated he lived for the weekends. At this age, he went to Chicago for a vacation and met a man at a bath club. The man was black. They went back to his apartment, and Jeffrey drugged him. He stated that for some reason, he did not do anything else. He just masturbated and kissed this man, and the man left. He did not kill this man, and he felt that it might be that he was not as attracted to him as he thought he would be. At age 30, Jeffrey met his 10th victim, Curtis Strotter. I I'm not sure how you pronounce the name, Mr. Boyce. Um, who was 18. He met him in Wisconsin and propositioned him. This victim wanted to perform anal sex on Jeffrey, and Jeffrey did not want him to. Jeffrey drugged him, cuffed him, and then strangled him. He posed him for pictures. He kept the head, genitals, hands, and acidified the flesh. What did he mean by he posed him for pictures? Um, Jeffrey had pictures in his apartment of men uh, in different poses, and he would take his victim, some of them, and put them on the table that was part of his temple and try to imitate the poses of the men who were in the pictures. Did you see those pictures of uh, his uh, apartment showing those men uh, that were on the uh, wall of the apartment? Yes, I did. And were the poses of the victims that he put on the black table were they like the poses of the people in the pictures that were on his wall? Yes, they were. But the pictures of the people that were on his wall were not pictures of dead people. They were like posters. That's correct. Okay, so he placed the dead victims in the same pose and took pictures of them. That's correct. Let's continue on, please. You say he posed him for pictures. He kept the head... He preserved the hands, genitals, and skull in formaldehyde. He masturbated a couple of times after he strangled him. He reported that he began watching Exorcist Three at this time, and he stopped watching Return of the Jedi. He reported that the character in Exorcist Three appealed to him, that character being Satan. Satan exuded, these were Jeffrey's words, Satan exuded control and power. Jeffrey reported that he felt corrupt and evil and identified with the character. He said that he would watch this movie before he went to the bar and when he brought people back to his apartment. Have you seen those two movies? Uh, Jeffrey suggested that I um, watch uh, the movies, and I have subsequently um, seen those two movies and have also asked Jeffrey what particular parts of the movies was it that he identified with, and then I have um, re-seen those parts of the movies. So you understand the parts that he was talking about. Yes, I do. At uh, least he was interested. Yes, I do. Continue, please. 
One or two months later, he met his 11th victim, Earl Lindsay. He reported that Lindsay was not gay. Um, the only reason I interrupt is I notice what I think is a typo. The name is Errol Lindsay. I'm sorry. Um, okay. and, and it's quite possible, Ms. White, that um, I may have um, misheard Jeffrey. I'm not Fine. sure. That, okay. That's the only reason I wanted so it, to correct it. It's Errol. Errol. He reported that Lindsay was not gay. He met him during the day on a street corner. He offered him money and brought him back to his house to watch Exorcist 3. I questioned Jeffrey about the body parts that he had stored in the freezer. He reported that periodically he would take portions out of the freezer and cook them. While he ate, he would become aroused. Uh, he never gave any of the victim's body parts to eat. Um, that might be a bit confusing there. What I asked Jeffrey is when he brought other people over to his house, did he ever offer them um, any of the body parts of cooked body parts of people? Uh, regarding Errol Lindsay, he reported that um, he did not have sex with him before he drugged him. He then drugged him and his victim fell asleep. The behavior again escalated at this point. Jeffrey noted that he was sick of doing what he was doing and wanted to render his victim zombies. He had a handheld drill and bored a hole in the skull to the brain. He used a large syringe and filled it with acid, which he injected into the frontal lobes so that his victim would still be able to follow commands. He reported that his victim woke up after the first injection, stated that he was groggy and had a headache. He then gave him more sleeping pills. He then strangled this victim, posed him, took pictures, laid with the victim, and masturbated. He acidified the flesh and skeleton, but kept the skull. Jeffrey reported that he had used a paring knife because he tried to preserve the skin, but this did not work. Doctor, let me stop you at this point. <clears throat> Was there any chance in the world that Jeffrey Dahmer in trying to zombieize these poor folks was going to ever be able to accomplish that? Um, and the, that home uh, drilling, the way he was trying to do it. Objection. She's not a medical I doctor. Mean, I think that it's outside her area of expertise. Okay. You ever worked in a hospital, doctor? Yes. Have you done any training uh, in a hospital? Uh, oh, go ahead. Forget it. Continue on. Oh. Um, a few months later, he met his 12th victim, Tony Hughes, who he reported was a, a deaf mute in his mid-20s. Uh, Tony was black. Friends of Tony's drove him to um, Jeffrey's apartment. They kissed, watched videos, and he gave him drugs. He did not remember drilling holes in uh, Tony, but he stated that he must have because Tony was dead when Jeffrey awakened. He had sex with him and laid with him. Um, Jeffrey laid his body on the corner of his bedroom floor. At age 31, when Jeffrey was 31, he met his 13th victim, Conorax. Uh, uh, Sentence of bone. A 15-year-old male. He reported that he went to a mall at 5 in the evening and that in the eating area and was in the eating area of the mall. He was about to go home when he saw a Eurasian man walking into the mall. He propositioned him and offered him $50 to allow him to take pictures. I, I don't want you to read the next sentence. Uh, because okay. uh, right now that that would be a it, that's an identifier and we're not identifying that next sentence. So okay. uh, he gave him a drink, drilled holes in his skull and filled it with acid. At one point in the morning, his victim was still sleeping and Jeffrey went out to a bar for a beer. As he was leaving the bar, he saw his victim sitting at the side of the road. He was naked and two females were around him. The police came, as did a fire truck. The police got out and asked what was going on. Jeffrey told him that this was a friend of his who was drunk. The police believed him, wrapped him in a blanket, and walked the victim back to his apartment. The police entered the apartment. Jeffrey stated that there was a body in his apartment in the bedroom. He, he didn't state you. that to the police. the police. That's that. correct. Go ahead. However, the police never entered or looked in the bedroom. The police laid this victim on the sofa. 
The police saw two photos that Jeffrey had taken of the victim, and one officer held up a photo as if to say, and these are Jeffrey's words, see, he's telling the truth. Jeffrey gave this victim one more injection, and that was fatal. He then posed the victim, took pictures, had anal sex with him, and masturbated. He acidified the flesh and the skeleton, defleshed and saved the skull, the compulsion was so strong that the police being there did not make any difference, and he continued in his behavior. Shortly after this, he met his 14th victim, Matt Turner, a 20-year-old black male. Jeffrey had attended the Chicago Gay Pride Parade and met this victim at a bus station. He offered him money, took him home to watch Exorcist Three, had light sex, drugged him, and strangled him. He defleshed and acidified the body, saved the skeleton in the freezer, and put the head in the freezer. He threw the other body parts into the trash. Jeffrey noted that around this time, the body meat in his freezer was getting old, and he disposed of it. One or two weeks later, he met his 15th victim, Jeremiah Weinberger, age 25, who was of Jewish Puerto Rican descent. He met him at a bar in Chicago. He approached his victim, offered him money. The victim performed oral sex on Jeffrey. They took the bus back to his home. They kissed, engaged in masturbation, watched a video, and Jeffrey then gave him a drink. Once he was unconscious, he drilled a hole in his head and used boiling water. He reported that this victim woke up and was functioning but was groggy. Jeffrey then gave him more pills and another injection. He reported that the victim went into a coma, and the next morning he was still in a coma, and Jeffrey tried to wake him up. Jeffrey went to work, and when he returned home, he found that the victim was dead. He stated that he felt bad because he wanted the victim to be coherent and to carry on a conversation with him. Jeffrey stated that he engaged in the drilling technique to avoid having to strangle and kill his victims. I asked Jeffrey how things were going at work at this period of time, and he told me that he had been missing days at work because of his victims. He said he was at a point where he could have been fired. One or two weeks later, he met his 16th victim, Oliver Lacey. He reported that Oliver was black and was a bodybuilder. He offered him money. They had light sex. They watched a video, and Jeffrey drugged him. He reported that he then called into work sick, and he was then fired. He had kept the headless body of his 15th victim in his bathtub. According to Jeffrey, Oliver never saw that body. Jeffrey reported that he did not use drilling on this victim. He drugged him, strangled him, performed anal sex before and after death, posed him, and took pictures. He also defleshed his 15th victim at this time and saved the head. He was going to use Victor Oliver Lacey in his temple area. At this point, he had lost his job, was drinking heavily, and running out of money. One week after he had strangled Oliver Lacey, he bought a 57-gallon drum to acidify all of the skeletons that he was going to keep. He then met his 17th victim, Joseph Bredehoff, who he stated was Caucasian. They had drinks together. He offered him money. He drugged him and strangled him. Jeffrey reported that, quote, not much sex occurred, end quote. He defleshed him, put the skeleton and head in the freezer, put his clothes in the trash after he cut them up, and did not take any pictures because he was out of film. After this victim, there was another one whose name he could not recall. He had put cuffs on this victim, and the victim ran out of his apartment. Jeffrey reported that during this time, he had been drinking 150 proof rum. He indicated that three police officers came, went to get the key for the handcuffs, and saw pictures that Jeffrey had taken of his victims. He was then arrested. He reported that he was very frightened when he was arrested. He stated that he did not immediately have a sense of relief, but this occurred several days later when he knew that his behavior had come to an end. I asked him whether consciously he had wanted to be apprehended, and he said no. Jeffrey stated that in looking back, he realized how horrible his acts were, the impact that all of this must be having on his victims' families. He reported that he had depersonalized his victims and never asked any questions about their lives. 
He reported that he had been consumed by desire and would not have been able to do it if he had known these people on a personal basis. They became objects to him. I questioned him about his sexual fantasies and urges since his arrest. He reported that they are not as strong as they had been pre-arrest and that he has no desire to commit violence. He tries to keep sexual thoughts out of his mind. He reported that it is quite possible that the compulsion would return if he was not in a structured environment and stated, quote, it would be nice to get rid of it completely, end quote. He reported that he had killed a total of 17 people and that once apprehended, he wanted to, quote, tell all, end quote. I asked if there were people that he had not killed, and he said that there were three. He did not murder these people because either he was not attracted to them or he did not have pills to drug them with. I asked him if throughout the course of his life he has ever had a relationship that had any degree of depth. He disclosed there has been no person since his childhood friend, Initial D, in terms of the depth of feelings in a relationship. In terms of relationships, Jeffrey reported that he, quote, fell into a mode that didn't deviate, end quote. He said this was a mode of meeting people and not having any degree of social intimacy or contact with them. When asked about why he did not develop a relationship with another person, he told me that all of the people he met gave time frames, that is, where they had to be at a certain time, that they had to go home, that they had to be with someone else. He did not feel that he could leave any of these people in his apartment and that he wanted contact with people. Now, if I may comment there, Mr. Boyle, because um, it, it's the reason that he didn't want to bring anybody back to his apartment and have a relationship because he didn't know what he would do in terms he was interested in putting people out and having sex with them. He didn't know what he'd do with body parts that he stored in his apartment or how he would continue this. <laughs> By drugging the people and then killing them, he would have people who would remain and stay with him. In regard to his alcohol abuse, he reported that during college, while in the army and after the army, he was dependent upon and abused alcohol. He indicated that he would drink one case of beer every weekend. I asked him if he passed out and he stated rarely. He did recall, however, that when he was on work release, he was given a pass at Thanksgiving and he did not want to go home, so he went to the mall, which he discovered was closed. He then went to a bar and drank beer and a whiskey called Yukon Jack. He drank one bottle. He then went to a gay bar and went home with some man he met there. He blacked out at this person's apartment, and when he awakened, he was hogtied. He had bruises on his leg, and the man was doing something with a candle in Jeffrey's rectum. When he came to, he yelled. Jeffrey reported that his leg was beaten raw, but he did not have any anal damage. Jeffrey reported that during this time period of luring people to his apartment and then killing them, he felt emotionally dead. I asked him about his health. He reported that he does not get any exercise in prison and that, do you still want me to go on with it? Yes, please. And that he is taking a medication, he didn't know the name of it, but described it as a little purple pill to relieve body itching. He reported that he sleeps okay, except for a fellow inmate who screams during the night and wakes him up. I asked him if he has any dreams about his victims, and he reports that he does not. He then did recall one dream in which there was a modern building and all young people in their 20s lived there. There were males as well as females, and they were dressed in leather, and they were on the floor eating something. He stated that he walked into a room, and on the walls were that should be pastel colors, like being projected. He reported that the floor was misty and there was a guy there walking toward him, but the man never got close to him. He reported that he woke up. He indicated that in the dream, he did not recall feeling attracted to this person. Uh, Jeffrey, again, I asked him about whether he knew if what he was doing was right or wrong. He knew that the behavior he had been engaging in was wrong. He indicated, however, that, quote, after the ambassador incident, I was not able to control the behavior, end quote. Further sexual history, he reported that at the bathhouse, he got erections approximately 10% of the time, but was never able to ejaculate. Once his partners were drugged, however, he got erections 100% of the time, and he was able to ejaculate. At his apartment, he got erections 10% of the time when his victims were awake, once drugged, he got, once drugged, he got erections 100% of the time. He reported that the sexual acts were more erotic once his victim was dead. 
During the course of all of these events, he masturbated two times a day. His fantasies were a person being comatose approximately 75% of the time. The remainder of his fantasies involved his victim being dead and having sex with him. I asked Jeffrey again why he killed his victims. He reported that he did not just drug them and have sex with them and let them leave because he wanted to keep them. He wanted them to stay with him. I asked him if he had ever been arrested for other types of behavior. He reported that he had been arrested for drunken disorderly conduct, exhibitionism, taking pictures of a minor, and for his present crimes. He also had been arrested for shoplifting a leather coat, and he indicated that he did steal a mannequin. Jeffrey reported that he never learned how to develop close relationships, and most of his activities were solitary. He responded, quote, my emotions were deadened from Hicks on, end quote. I asked him about his therapeutic contacts with Dr. Rosen, who he saw after he was arrested for exhibitionism. He informed me that three quarters of the way into therapy, the incident occurred at the Ambassador Hotel. He reported that therapy was expensive and he had to take the bus 10 miles to get there. He stated that he was resentful towards the therapist and that he did not feel that it would make much difference. He found therapy was not helpful and then stated, quote, but it was my fault, not hers, end quote. Jeffrey reiterated that he never blamed anyone for his actions and that he accepts responsibility. He said, quote, the truth has a way of coming out, end quote. He said that talking with the detectives was a purging for him. He saw it as a confession. He claimed that he believes in a life after death and wants to get what he has done out in the open. I questioned him further about his interest in the satanic. He disclosed that he could not control his impulses and gradually surrendered to them. He then felt evil and began reading the Satanic Bible and watching Exorcist Three. Prior to this, he had watched Return of the Jedi and began wearing the yellow contacts to be like an emperor. He felt that given what he was doing, he was like Satan himself. I asked Jeffrey whether or not there was a family history of criminal behavior. He reported there was not except that his brother David broke a window at a railroad station at age 12. He stated that presently his brother does computer work um, at a company. Jeffrey stated that while in Milwaukee, he felt closest to his grandmother. She was always kind to him and she was a perfect grandmother and quote, you couldn't ask for an, anyone nicer, end quote. He also revealed that he despises the attention that this case is getting. He stated, quote, I was always a private person, end quote. I asked him if he had ever read cases about serial killers and he told me that he had not. He said further that he had no fascination and never read any crime magazines or any type of material along this line. I questioned him about how he felt now, and he presented me with a passage from his Bible, and it's Romans 7, 14, and I quote, For what I want to do, I don't do, but what I hate, I do, and if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good, end quote. What did that mean to you? That, um... That on some level, he didn't want to be killing the people he was killing and having sex with them after death. Um, and that he hated doing that, but he couldn't do other than that. And he agrees, in essence, with the laws that people should not be allowed to do that. Go ahead. I asked Jeffrey what he thought would happen in the future. He said he wanted to have a situation where he could have peace and quiet, where he could read, write, listen to a radio. He stated that that was the best he could hope for. He also stated at this point that it was painful to think about the victim's family members and what they are going through, and that in the future he wanted to write a letter of apology to the victim's family members. In further discussing the situation in prison, he reported that he has not received any mental health therapy. He served three meals a day. He reported that last Sunday he became angry because they took his pen away from him. I asked him what his parents are presently doing. He said that his mother is a mental health worker and is living in California. He stated she's in her mid-50s. His father works uh, in another city and lives with his wife. Because Jeffrey was so interested in physiques, I questioned him about whether or not he had ever worked out. He said that he worked out on and off at home, but he never really stuck to it. He did for a while have a membership to uh, a, a health club. I questioned him about why he had purchased the Griffins. He indicated that they are representative of evil. He stated again that after the ambassador incident, things really went, quote, full-fledged wrong, end quote. I asked him about whether he had any auditory or visual hallucinations. 
He reported that he did not. When I asked him if he had done much traveling during his lifetime, he reported that other than being stationed in Germany and traveling to Munich, living in Miami, and going to New Mexico as a Boy Scout, he had done no other traveling. After he was arrested the second time, he reported that he moved out of the 24th Street apartment and met a black man and brought him back to his apartment, even though he no longer lived there. The apartment had been rented. He then went to the basement with the man. He reported that the guy knocked him out, kicked him, took his money, $300. When he recovered, he was taken to the hospital, kept overnight, and his head injury was sutured. I asked him whether or not he was able to cry and when was the last time he cried. He reported that the last time he cried was when he was in college following his first victim. He stated that he was feeling bad about having killed the person, was drinking out of control and cried. He reported that he is, quote, surprised, end quote, that he, quote, did that, end quote, to 17 people. He stated that it feels like a twilight state. He then stated that he wished he could die, that his heart would stop beating. During this interview, Jeffrey drew a picture of it, the temple that he had planned to build. It consisted of a table, and in front of the table was a black chair. On either side of the table were reconstructed skeletons that were to be painted. On the table, there were to be incense on both ends and 10 painted skeletons. There was to be a wall plaque, a blue curtain, and a lamp with blue globe lights. Mr. Dahmer is a blonde-haired, hazel-eyed, six-foot, 175-pound, single Caucasian male. He was escorted to the interview by guards. He was wearing prison garb. His behavior could be described as being cooperative throughout the interview. Through most of the interview, he drank coffee, smoked, and during each session, he ate a bag of M&Ms. He was oriented to time, place, and person. He knew the month, did not know the date. He was off by two days, and he knew the current year. There was no evidence of hallucinations or delusions or psychotic thought processes. His memory appeared intact. He did not have difficulty concentrating. His affect was appropriate given the situation. In discussing his victims, he reported the events in a rather rote, matter-of-fact manner. It was only towards the end of the second interview when Jeffrey was reflecting on what he had done that he appeared to evidence remorse about his behaviors. Now, um, that completed your poem. This was not my report. This that, were my notes on my interviews. Let me have yellow. You can carry over a copy. Uh, so I would have to be my business. Mm -hmm. Doctor, you have told us about a diagram that Jeffrey Dunner drew for you. With number 31 for identification. And I ask you if this is the diagram that Jeffrey Dotton drew for you concerning this temple that he was going to create in his apartment with the body parts and the way in which you had mentioned. Yes. Was that drawn in your presence? Yes, it was. And who drew it? Jeffrey did. Did you have him initial it? Um, Jeffrey did not um, initial it. I put the date and that it was his drawing, and I put down these were reconstructed uh, skeletons. Uh, was this important in your psychological evaluation of Mr. Donner? to have some idea what he was talking about in order for you to understand what he was doing? Um, well, Jeffrey offered to uh, to draw that, but it was helpful in terms of getting a sense of what he was going to be doing with the skeletons and skulls that he was saving. Move that defendant's exhibit number 31 be received in evidence as exhibit E. Proceed. I would then ask the court to tell the court that I have made 14 copies of this for the uh, jury to see and I ask that it be published. Any objection? Your Honor, I have no objection if it's published, but I don't think everyone should keep one since we've got one in evidence. Oh, I don't mean it that way. I just mean so when he's describing it, they'll. I have. That's fine. Okay. During the time that we testified concerning the exhibit. Concerning that exhibit. Yeah. Um, yeah. Doctor, while these are being tapped out, Judge, may I? Uh, you've got it. You do not. Uh, this will be fine. We can do it. Well, the judge is sitting in case. Um, The jury is getting a copy of it. 
be a good thing when they seem to be. I'm sorry. The jury is getting copies of the exhibit, and when they have them completed, you're satisfied they have them. Would you explain to them what your understanding was? I don't want to ask any questions about it. Just explain how you understood him to explain what he was going to do there. Well, as you can see on the bottom, and Jeffrey labeled this, there was going to be a black chair. He had already purchased the black table. He had been saving uh, skulls from his victims and had been spray painting them. They were to be on top of the table, and he would be burning incense. He had been saving the skeletons and were go was going to reconstruct them and then to paint them. Uh, in the back, he was to have a, a curtain. There were to be these lights and these wall plaques. Uh, Jeffrey believed um, that by constructing uh, this temple, that he would be receiving special um, energies and powers that would help him in a number of areas of his life. Where did you understand this temple was going to be in his apartment? You know, I don't think I, I don't think I asked him that. Were you ever over at his apartment? Yes, I was. Give the jury a general idea of the kind of apartment it was. Well, it, it's interesting, Mr. Boyle, when you uh, read police uh, evidence and descriptions of a, a place, in, in my mind, I thought it was much larger than it was. It is a very, very tiny apartment. That, that, that should give us a sufficient description. Who was going to sit in the black chair? Jeffrey. And if you look at this table, did he do that in your presence, by the way? Or did he bring that to you, this diagram? No, no he asked for a piece of paper and uh, borrowed a pencil or pen and drew it. How many painted skulls does he show on this black table? On the table, there are 10. I think uh, we can pick them. When he was sitting in the black chair, did you ask him what kind of power he was going to be getting from whatever he was looking at? Well, uh, I think I had mentioned earlier that he was going to be getting uh, some kind of power that would be helping him financially and socially. Um, okay. Now, I'm going to have to ask you some very uh, difficult questions. And that is, did you uh, ask uh, Jeffrey Dahmer questions relative to, uh, by the way, did you see the pictures, the hundreds and hundreds of pictures that were in the possession of the Milwaukee Police Department, of which we got copies? Um, your assistant showed me many pictures uh, that I viewed before interviewing Jeffrey. You're satisfied that you've seen enough? I don't care to see any more. Yes. Uh, was he 100% honest with you as far as you're concerned as a clinician uh, interviewing somebody uh, with uh, the kind of uh, history that Mr. Dahmer has? Um, object to the form of the question. 100% honest with you. I, I didn't mean 100%. Let me ask you this. Let me rephrase it. Excuse me. Let me rephrase. That was very clumsy of me. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, when you are interviewing someone, what must you, as an expert in the field of clinical psychology, conclude on the question of the honesty of the interviewee? Well, I mean, one, you want to know if the person's reliable. Basically, do they tell the same story um, the next time you meet with them? Uh, and two, is what they're saying accurate based on other information or data that you have available to you? And as it related to Jeffrey Dahmer, how did you find him? Well, um, in general, I found that there was um, consistency and also um, congruency in terms of what he reported in general and what I read um, in the um, confession that he gave. However, there uh, were some areas of um, inconsistency. Uh, also, with um, all the years of experience that I have had in interviewing people who have paraphilias, I know that for the most part, you never get the whole story the first time, sometimes not the second time, and sometimes you need to know them for many months before you get the whole story, and sometimes you never get the whole story. Did you ask uh, Mr. Dahmer whether or not he wanted to have sex with live or dead men. Yes, I did. And what did he respond? 
Um, what he told me was that um, most of his arousal, what he was attracted to, was being sexual with a person when they were not conscious. And did you ask him it, uh, to define what consciousness meant? When they were not in a, in a waking state. Did you ask him what most sexually attracted him or aroused him? Yes, he was most attracted to um, young men with uh, beautiful bodies and nice physiques. Uh, so much so to the point that it's uh, my understanding that um, he helped identify one or two of his victims. He was so focused on physique that he knew one kidney was missing and he knew there were some scars under the nipples of one of the people. Did you uh, come to a, a belief, an opinion, to a reasonable degree of uh, psychological certainty in talking to Mr. Dahmer as to whether or not he was or was not interested in consensual sex? Well, uh, I came to the opinion that he was interested in sex with people when they were unconscious, and that you cannot give consent to sex when you're unconscious. There is a distinction between being unconscious and dead. Yes. Relative to that, what was your opinion as to what Jeffrey Dahmer wanted to do or not to do? Well, what Jeffrey, um, there are two points to this, okay? One is what Jeffrey told me. And Jeffrey told me 75% of his attraction was to men when they were not conscious. 25% were when they were dead. That's what he said. Let's look, however, at what he did. What he did was he had sex with them once they were dead. And now, in that regard, as tough a question as this to ask you, and as tough as the answer is going to be, did you go into any detail with Jeffrey Dahmer as to whether or not he did or did not have sex with every one of his victims, how often he had sex, and the type of sex that he had? I did. And what did you find? Well, I think as I mentioned previously, Mr. Boyle, I found in interviewing Jeffrey that in, in some sense it was not difficult for him to describe what he did with the bodies in terms of getting to the skeleton part. What I felt was difficult was for him to be very graphic in the description of the sexual activity he engaged in with the people after they were dead. So, uh, and knowing that people have difficulty with this, I um, asked him more detailed questions upon my return here. And it was um, as I had suspected, um, in that he did have sex with and, and I apologize again for the graphic nature of this. He did have sex with every one of the 17 victims. With, I believe it was 14 um, of his victims, he cut every single one of his victims open in the abdomen. With 14 of his victims, he placed his penis inside the viscera, inside the cavity of the body, and he got an erection and ejaculated inside the bodies of these people. With, I believe it was five or six of the people, the skulls and the heads that he kept, he placed his penis inside of the mouth of the decapitated person, and he got erections, and he ejaculated. And it was with five or six of the people um, after death that he engaged in anal sex with them. You see, Jeffrey talked about masturbating in front of or over the bodies, and I felt that there was more to it than that, but he had a discomfort in talking about it. Doctor, I'm going to show you the exhibit that is now uh, called uh, Defendant Exhibit 27. That's the diagnostic and statistical manual of mental disorder. I'm going to ask you to look at the subcommittees on the sexual disorders on therapeutics. And I'm going to ask you to tell us whether or not the name of Judith Becker, PhD, appears to Yes, it does. You were one of how many people on that committee? Nine. What was Mr. Dahmer's paraphilia? Well, um, I gave him the diagnosis of necrophilia. Um, Mr. Boyle, we don't, or at least I have not been able to find um, in the literature a diagnosis 
to cover. And I think necrophilia should be, uh, this should be an extension of necrophilia, and I will propose it um, to the people who work on these. I could not find a, a paraphilia describing somebody having sex with an individual who is comatose but a word for it, something feel ya. Um, but I think that we can conceive that as a natural extension because the person is in a state that is not a lifelike state. When you are out in a coma or like a zombie, it's like you're dead. I mean, your heart's beating and you're breathing, but basically it's like you're dead. Uh, also, um, and again, I uh, his attraction to putting his penis inside the body. There's a uh, term called partialism. Uh, people attracted to not the whole body necessarily, but to parts of it. Um, and, and I see that as being a part of this too. Partialism is a paraphilia? Yes. And it's arousal as a part of a body rather than the body. A body, body. part, yeah. Well, what's an example of that uh, other well, than what we're talking about there, here? There are some individuals who are sexually attracted uh, to stumps. That is, they search out people who are amputees because they find the stump erotic. That's an example. And, and Jeffrey Dahmer had some of that uh, partialism problem also? Yes, he was not attracted to stumps, but the but, head and into the body. Now, doctor, I don't want to be repetitious, and I think I'm about finished with my examination. You have testified, uh, I believe, that... Uh, to the, to the legal standard, but once again, your findings that you have made earlier as to Jeffrey Dahmer's mental disease at the time of the commission of the offense was that he was suffering from mental disease. That's correct. And it is, as you have told us, necrophilia. That's correct. Which is part of the paraphilia family. That's correct. Are all necrophiliacs mentally ill or diseased? I'm sorry. Do all people have necrophilia and mental suffering from a mental disease? No. As Mr. Dahmer was going along these killing sprees, what was happening to his concept of capacity to conform and the lack thereof? It was eroding. Uh, as a matter of fact, and again, this was not in my notes, um, Jeffrey said to me after he lost his job, he said it was like all of the dominoes fell down. Tell us, Ed, or about the time of this young uh, Conorak situation where the police were in his apartment. Can you tell us, uh, basically, at about that time, about his the concept of his ability to conform his conduct to requirements of law? Well, there's a there's a phrase that um, is sometimes used in forensic work, and the phrase is, "If there was a cop at your elbow, if there was a policeman at your elbow." Um, and I, I said, looking at the behavior, I mean, um, he, here was a person, you know, that he was going um, to drug, um, to kill, to have sex with, who ran out. The neighbors knew, people on the street, the policemen knew, the firemen knew, the policemen came to his house. There was another dead body in his house. You mean apartment? That's in his apartment. I mean, that comes as close as you can get to a policeman at your elbow. And it, it kind of frightened him, of course, that they were there. But that didn't stop him. He was arrested and on his way to prison, um, was receiving therapy, and he went out and killed. Um, that's not as close as the policeman in your apartment, you know, but that's kind of close. Time of the Cunarac situation, um, what was Jeffrey Dahmer's state as far as the uh, his lacking substantial capacity I, to conform? I believe he 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 did not have the capacity. I believe I asked you this. I, I'm confident I did, but it's been a long afternoon. State more than. He was suffering from a mental disease, which, uh, in your opinion, was an impairment of the mind. Did I not go through this with you? And that it was enduring? Yes. I thought through that already. And your answer was uh, that Jeffrey Dahmer was suffering from a mental disease that was an impairment of the mind, that it was enduring, and that it substantially affected his mental or emotional processes at the time of each and every one of the alleged offenses. Yes. And that is made to a 
reasonable degree of psychiatric certainty. I can't say I mean, psychiatric. Psych psych I can say First time I did that, I apologize. Psychological certainty. Yes. What about the fact that we we have an escalation? In other words, 78, 87, 88, 88, 88, 89 et cetera, and so forth. What do you say about that? Is he controlling himself during these period of times when there's lapses and he is not killing? Uh, Jeffrey still had, I mean, from uh, after he had um, killed that, the first person. I mean, he had the fantasies before. He killed the person. Mr. Hicks. He, yes, he, he still had a mental disorder, necrophilia. He tried to control it, and he very he successfully controlled it. And what Jeffrey articulates is with structure, you know, if he's got something to do, if there's in a structured situation, in a sense, um, by trying not to masturbate, being at his grandmother's house, at least for an initial period there, he was able to control. But then there was, as, as he mentioned, um, he's... Uh, in the library, uh, gets a note, starts breaking down. And, and you can see, I mean, if you were actually to, at one point there, to start plotting the number of victims, I mean, uh, you would see very quickly how they're mounting and adding up. That's all I have. Thank you, Doug. Wait, how do you want to proceed? Well, the four months I can go now. I mean, it'll take. How late is the court going tonight? Well, oh. is your going to cross examination and take more than half an hour? Uh, yes, probably. Then maybe we better start fresh tomorrow morning. Huh? Mm -hmm. 8.30 tomorrow morning. Courts and recess.